rather than do the usual let's play we'll call this a mm, yeah, we'll call it a here's how it's done or here's how it works here's how it works that sounds better here's how it works D-Day at Peleliu and as it says it's a solitaire game and of course it's a war game uh, what I do recommend is you go to boardgamegeek.com and download the flipbook that is on the site. Uh, this goes through the rules and it has the rules per turn, so it's quite handy that way. I'm not going to go through all the rules up front. We'll do the rules as we get to them. So, let's make a start on the setup. Okay, just before we zoom in and look at the, the Japanese units, which is these guys, we'll have a look at the, this top section of the board. Uh, like every other war game, it runs on turns. So, you see here the turn track, it's called. This little turn marker just lets you, basically lets you remember where you are in the game, which turn, turn one, you can move it across to turn two, and so on. Um, don't worry about these, these will come in later on. These are the reserve Japanese units because in the instructions it tells you that you have, let's have a look, you've got 51 Japanese units and 15 go into the reserves and the rest go on the board here. These are all your depth markers, we'll come to them later on. Uh, they're your little added extra surprises. And up here are the phases, and again, you can move this phase marker just to remind yourself what phase you're in. And the idea is that you have turn one, and you work your way through these phases, then you go to the next turn, again, work your way through the phases. Uh, this is your cards, we'll come to the cards again as we need them, but again, there's no dice, the whole thing is uh, driven using cards. So, let's zoom in and look at a Japanese unit. Okay, here's the Japanese units. Uh, you place the Japanese units on the hexes. I hope you can see it. There's a little black square with a white X just there. And the Japanese units get placed in those hexes. So there's one there, one there, one there and they cover the board so what is a Japanese unit? okay I'll try and bring one in a bit closer and hopefully it'll focus there we go that is a Japanese unit so at the top you have the actual name of the unit in this case it's an infantry oops autofocus just doesn't want to work for me anyway the one is the strength of the unit and over in the left corner there's usually uh, which weapons are required to defeat that unit so in this case it's BR which is a browning rifle and We'll come to that when we get to the US units as to which units have what weapons. But let me just get another one for an example. Uh, I'm taking these from the reserve units. This one's another one. If the camera will focus for me. Oh, go on. Focus. Be a good camera. There we go. Uh, this guy, again, he is one strength, but he requires FL. FL is not a weapon, in this case it's flanking. So you need to have US units with a gap between them to count as flanking. Otherwise you just can't beat the guy. Well, you could, but it would be very difficult. Um, and it will make your life difficult. This game is difficult. So... We've got the Japanese side set up, and I'll just try and pan across 
hopefully it doesn't go all horrible and you can see here I've got these guys and let's get this marker and top saying disrupted these are the Japanese tank units and they start the game disrupted and have a depth marker below them so they are pretty tricky but they're disrupted in the first turn so they don't get to go on the first turn speaking of depth markers I'll just grab a couple off the bundle here so an example is show you this side is that is the depth marker which says depth on it if the camera will focus again that's your depth marker and when you flip it over in this case it adds one strength to the unit and it adds the CC which in this case is close combat so you'd have to close combat that unit and another one is an example uh, this would add two strength to the unit and require a flamethrower and same again for that one this would add one again flamethrower so the depth markers are an added surprise when you get to flip it but we'll come to that when we actually do combat next thing is the American units okay American units here is an example of an American unit and in this case that is the title of the unit that's the icon which is infantry in this case the 7-2 seven, 7 is the strength and 2 is the range so this guy can fire two hexes away the circle is a shape and the four dots here on the left are what's known as steps you can kind of think of them as lives or people within a unit but the idea is when this unit is hit and damaged you flip the counter it goes from being four to being three if it gets hit again then that counter gets swapped for this counter which is the same name but this time it has two left and gets hit one left gets hit again he's gone this unit's gone now when I was talking earlier about weapons that are required there's a certain when you look at the tables that you get with the game it tells you the weapons that you get for a particular unit, in this case infantry. So it'll tell you a whole list of things that you've got by default. Um, things like machine guns, uh, that kind of thing. But when it gets hit and goes from four steps to three steps, you'll see here at the side these are the weapons it now has so when the unit gets hit it loses weapons so you don't really want to be getting hit because obviously when you get to even less steps you have less weapons so you've got to keep an eye on that when it gets to a, a combat situation where you have this guy, this unit, they have the Browning and a Bazooka, but maybe the Japanese unit requires a flamethrower, which they just don't have. Or a machine gun, which they no longer have. They did have, but they don't now. So that's the American unit, but there's one last thing, which is on the right hand side, sorry, left hand side here, it has a couple of numbers and get it to focus in on those numbers there's a number four that means that this unit only comes into play on the fourth turn 
and the OR is orange which means that he comes in on one of the orange landing boxes which we'll come to in a minute but all of the units have these kind of markings on them so for example here's a tank he comes in on turn 3 O1 means he comes in in box orange 1 he has a strength of 3 and can go for a range of 6 hexes circle shape and he's got two steps which is what tanks start with is just two steps and on the back you can see that as the strength goes down then the range can also change in some cases it doesn't in this case but the strength goes from 3 to 2 and he only has one step left so it's kind of crucial you've got to watch the steps and what you've got left um, so that's pretty much the basics of the American units and like I said they all go into particular rounds and I'll set them up and I'll come back in a sec ok I've got the Americans set up here and this is the turn track again so it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then 9 to 16, 17 to 24. The, as I say, the first scenario does 1 to 12, which I have never been past about 9, if I'm lucky. So it is pretty tough going. Um, first phase, all you really get is 3 amphibious vehicles, but you can see there's a whole bunch of people come in on turns 2 and 3 some in 4, some in 5 but you can see from 6 onwards you get hardly any backup so you've got to be careful what you do with all these people because you're not going to get any more until about turn 17 and if you get to turn 17 you're doing better than me because I certainly don't get to 17 no chance, I get to about 9 if I'm lucky so we'll start off and I'll put out these three ready to come in and land and then we can nearly get started on turn one. Okay, nearly ready for turn one. But before we do that, here's a quick look again at this amphibious vehicle. And as you can see on the right hand side, there's a 1, so this is turn 1. W1 is white 1. So, where is white 1? White 1 is here. This little icon here is the armor symbol. So, this guy is going to go here. The next guy is, again, Turn 1, he is O1, so he's orange 1. Orange 1 is, oops, need to try and get it to focus again. Come on camera, you can do it. Orange 1 is this one, and again, armor symbol, there he is. Last guy is orange 3, which is here. Again, in he goes. Now, there's one last thing before um, beginning turn one, and that is the instructions tell you, which, and I'm just going to have a look at this flip book again. It tells you as part of it that there's a pre-invasion bombardment, which is that you draw one action card and you place a disruption on all Japanese units matching the three colours in the card. So, let's go for that. Let's take a card. And I'll just show you there. The card is three parts. The top part is landing. The middle part is the events. The bottom part is fire information. So what it means is we've got purple, blue and green. So what it means is that the Japanese units that are purple, blue and green are going to start disrupted which means they won't get to fire on turn one. 
So the disruption marker here that's on the tank, those are going to go on this guy, because he's purple. It's going to go on this guy because he's blue. And one this guy because he's green. And I think that's almost up. There's one over here, purple. And I believe there's another blue just outside the camera. There's a blue and a purple just outside camera as well. And I think that's pretty much it. Uh, purple and there's another blue way over the far end. But it's not as simple as that. No, that would be too easy. Because, oops, missed a couple there. There's another green. Because the rules also state in probably small print, except in coral and mountain terrain. So, coral terrain which I'll zoom in in a minute just to show you the different types of terrain and stuff, but uh, that is coral terrain. That purple guy there. So he is not disrupted because he is in coral. So we're going to have a look at this guy. Nope, he stays disrupted. Nope, all good. Because the mountainous terrain is just off camera but it's just up there top left uh, there's a purple here there's a purple there they're okay they're still disrupted there's some in the right hand side just off camera that they will not be disrupted because they're in coral area so we've got people disrupted which is good because that means they won't fire and shoot the living daylights out of us. Would be better if there was more disrupted, but eh, them's the brakes. Uh, but that is pretty much it. Ready now for turn one, and we can discard that card. Okay, finally, we're on to turn one, phase one. Phase one is the US amphibious phase which is where these guys finally come ashore and hopefully don't come a cropper. Uh, the landing check for these guys, as the rule says, you draw a card, which we will do here. And this is a card. This is going to be the fate of our three tanks here. Which is... Okay, and we're only interested in the coloured squares at the bottom. Orange, red, purple, and a diamond shape. So, what we need to do is look at anything that's orange, red, or purple, that's Japanese. So, there's this guy, orange. He's projecting fire into this box here. And it's a solid orange circle. Or yellow. I keep calling them orange and yellow. Uh, I'll try and call it yellow. Yellow circle. That's intense fire. Anything that goes in there gets hit. Doesn't matter what it is, it's getting hit. I'll try and show a different one here so it shows up better on camera. But see this shaded dot? That's steady fire. That means they may get hit. So our amphibious guy here has a yellow shaded dot. So he may get hit. Why may? Well, it depends on the, the shape. He's a triangle. The card says a diamond. So he does not get hit by the yellow. So we'll look at the red. Red 
is firing, he's covering this area. Does he cover here? No. So red doesn't fire down here. And purple is this guy. Uh, and this guy has a depth marker. So this means effectively he can fire twice. So he's firing in here as well as a solid purple. Now remember solid means that he gets hit no matter what. So this guy is unfortunately in intense fire from this purple guy so he takes a hit. So let's see if we get any other We've got another one here, he's projecting fire out here, solid yellow, which means that this guy also takes a hit. And up this end, as a purple, he's disrupted so he can't fire. So that's good, if nothing else. Now, the rules also state, and I'll just show you the, the table this is a table that you use for determining who's hit and who's not hit by the Japanese intense fire steady fire now there is the other rule intense fire you get hit by a revealed position you will get hit if you are in intense fire and you are hit by an unrevealed position then you still get hit but as an added extra little lovely bonus you are also disrupted so it means that uh, two people that have just been hit are also disrupted so he's disrupted and He's disrupted. And that is pretty much it for the Japanese fire phase because uh, there's nothing else that will hit us that is on the card. Yellow, red, purple. So that's the Japanese fire phase. Okay, that was phase three. Phase 4 is a second event phase which doesn't come into play until turn 5. Uh, phase 5 is an HQ phase, doesn't come in until turn 8. So that means turn, or oh, sorry, phase 6. Finally, we get to do something. Which, since we have two that are disrupted, we can only use this guy to do something or other. So, I know for a fact we're going to have a whole bunch of troops coming in that's going to fill all these boxes. We're going to have three in each square here, or each landing box. So we're going to have three, 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 three. The best we can probably do is to have our amphibious vehicle here. He's got a strength of three and he can have a range of three. So... Really the best we can sort of hope for is to fire at this guy. Our best hope is we can disrupt him, really. We're probably not going to kill him. So we're going to do what's called barrage. And barrage is basically a hit and hope. What we need is we're going to draw a card and... If we can get his colour, then we can disrupt him. If we can get uh, our symbol and his colour on a card, then we're really doing good. And hopefully we can do more damage on him. So, the card in question is this one. And it says... Brown diamond? Well, I'll be. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing luck considering the luck I've had so far. So, if I look up the table for the 
for the US barrage, which is this one. Strength of barraging unit is 3, and we're looking for positions color only. Nope, both the positions color and the target symbol. So cross that, and it says Japanese unit is disrupted and remove depth. Well, that's great. He didn't have depth anyway, so the only thing we've really done is disrupted him, which is better than nothing because it means that, you know, less damage next time, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, but that is, that is it for the US action phase for this, this turn because normally you would get um, two things that you can do move or attack and that kind of thing again we'll cover that when we get more troops that are actually not broken and disabled um, so we'll go now for end of turn so we're going to go to phase one of turn two where we bring in more troops <laughs> 